We're hearing five cases this morning, um, and all of them are mini oral arguments on the application. The first one is Janetsky versus the County of Saginaw in the Saginaw Prosecutor's Office. Um, Ms. McGee, that means you can try and reserve some of your 15 minutes. Um, good luck with that. Um, and you may begin whenever you're, you're, you're ready to. Thank you, uh, Justice McCormick, and good morning, all justices. My name is Carrie McGee. I represent the appellate in this matter, Jennifer Janetsky. I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Um, this case involves claims under the Whistleblowers Protection Act, Michigan Public Policy. Both claims are against the County of Saginaw and assertions of intentional torts against a governmental official, specifically the Saginaw County Chief Assistant Prosecutor, Christopher Boyd. Um, in this case, the Court of Appeals, in reversing the trial court's order denying the defendant's motion for summary disposition as to plaintiff's whistleblower's protection claim, public policy claims, and intentional tort claims, um, not only committed clear error um, because the plaintiff had establish each element of her claims. But their decision is important th to this court because it has significant public interest concerns in relation to how it analyzed, in particular, the Whistleblowers Protection Act. And I want to address that particular concern um, today with the court. In reversing the trial court's denial of the motion for summary disposition, as to plaintiff's whistleblowers protection act claim. What the Court of uh, Appeals did is they went in and analyzed and interpreted the laws that the plaintiff suspected had been violated and reported to the prosecutor, John McColgan. They interpreted these laws. They disagreed with her interpretation of the law. And because they disagreed with her interpretation of the law, they found that she didn't engage in protected activity, did not make a good faith uh, report of a suspected violation of the law. And this is not the law. This is not the law under the Whistleblowers Protection Act. This was erroneous and mandates a reversal. In a Whistleblowers Protection Act claim, the plaintiff has the burden of proving that she made a good faith belief report of a suspected or violation of law. She doesn't have to be right that the law was violated. She only has to be having a good faith belief. Even if she's wrong, she's engaged in protected activity. And in this particular case, the Court of Appeals really turned the law on the Whistleblowers Protection Act on its head and raised the bar. And in doing that, the ramifications are very significant. I mean, the when, you say, when you say they raised the bar, your, your client's a, a lawyer, right? She's a member of the bar. Correct. She's an experienced prosecutor. And as part of her job duties, she's responsible for knowing how to apply the Crime Victim Rights Act. That's correct. So isn't she appropriately held to a little bit higher standard in terms of understanding how that act works? Or should we just say, well, she didn't do a very good job or didn't really know her job or, you know, so we'll just let her go with that. I mean, in other words, it was, maybe the Court of Appeals was on to something here. It, 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 shouldn't, we, shouldn't we think that she, because otherwise people could just go into court and say, well, this act and this is how we've always done it, but I'm going to, you know, today I'm confused about how it should apply, so I'll, I'll just go, I'll go with that interpretation because I'm upset about what's, what's happening. Well, I understand what you're saying, Justice Viviano, and, and that would be true if it was clear that the law said one thing and, you know, the plaintiff reported something that clearly was not a violation of law. And that would be evidence of, in this particular case, knowing that it was false. But that didn't happen here, and that's not the really, that's not the Court of Appeals analysis. It's not as if they went to a law and they said, hey, look, this is clearly not the law. There's no violation here. Let's look at the Crimes Victims Act, because I think that's a really important one here. The Crimes Victim Act that Ms. Janetsky 
felt that Mr. Boyd had violated after, let's just be real, what happened here, he went behind her back when she was on her honeymoon, took a case she was leading that she wanted to try for criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, a life ascent, a, a sentence potentially, and while she was gone, he made a deal with the defense attorney to drop four of the charges, keep one, reduce it to uh, criminal sexual conduct, third degree, and sentence the, the defendant, he, his proposed sentence was probation with jail time. Let me, let, okay, me, but, let, me, let me ask you this. Putting aside whether that was a good <coughs> resolution of the case or a bad one, did he have the authority to do that? Yes, he had the authority to do that. Did he have the authority to propose a sentence that was entered or a a plea agreement, sentencing agreement that was entered by the court that imposed a sentence not permitted under law? No, he did not. How often does that happen in the trial courts in Michigan on a daily basis, would well, you say? Well, you know, I'm not a criminal attorney. I'm a okay. civil rights attorney. But I, was I will a trial, say this judge. I was judge, a trial court judge, and almost every day the parties came before the court and tried to get me to approve plea bargains that skirted the requirements right. of statutes. Right. And I just, echoing what uh, Justice Viviano is talking about, is it, is it that every time there's an internal dispute at a prosecutor's office where there's debate about what a statute says, and as long as someone goes and complains to a supervisor or the head prosecutor, are they now covered under the Whistleblowers Protection Act? I mean, I know as attorneys, we debate, we do it all the time up here. What does the law mean? That's our job. And I know that happens in prosecutors' offices all the time. Right. And more, more specifically, every time they hold out on their position, right? They're obstinate. They won't agree with their superior on what the proper interpretation of the law is or the, or the proper course of action. And so, you know, that would be maybe insubordination, right? And so are all those cases, there's lots of situations, I've seen it in others too, where when someone's job is to investigate uh, and prosecute people for violating the law or violating ordinances, building ordinances. I think it was a building ordinance case. Um, you could have this situation a lot. And I think the question is, is this really what the legislature and how they intended the Whistleblower Act to be applied? Well, I don't, I don't disagree with what either one of you said in terms of discourse within a prosecutor's office and disagreements and so forth. I understand that. And I'm not proposing that that be in any way prevented from happening. What I'm saying is what happened here is different, okay? What happened here is that not only was there a disagreement, but then there was a, a effort by the prosecutor to change the consequence of a defendant's actions and impose a sentence that was not lawful. And so what Ms. Janetsky was doing is when she learned that an order had been entered that imposed a sentence that was not appropriate under the law, and this is under MCL 771.1, that says probation is not permitted for a sexual, a criminal sexual conduct conviction. Is that and a law violation before the judge rules on whether it's permitted? under the statute or not, because at the point at which there was a dispute, there had been no adjudication by the court, so it was still a proposed uh, sentence, correct? That's true, it had not been, she, he, the defendant had not been sentenced yet. However, when- So if the judge said, no, I'm not gonna do that, there wouldn't have been a, a problem. And it, it seems to me if the judge said, put his or her blessing on it, then at least for purposes of that court, the, the proceedings in that court, it would be lawful, would it not? And, and the, the scenario if that happens, fine, but let's get back to what happened here. But the point is either way, yeah. either way. But, it's but not. the point here is what we're dealing with is the Whistleblowers Protection Act and whether Ms. Janetsky engaged in protected activity when she made a good faith belief report that a violation had occurred. And at that point, she not only did research, the evidence shows that she did research. By, by the way, these. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm, as I'm listening to you, I, I'm very sympathetic to what your client was trying to do. I'm not trying to sound unsympathetic. It seems like she was very engaged in this case and had worked with these uh, victims and was trying to come up with a, you know, a resolution, a, a, a proper resolution of the case, and it seems like she was undercut by her superiors. There's, there's right. no question, and whether that's good a practice in the office or for the elected prosecutor for to allow that to occur 
or for the supervisor to act in that manner is, is really not what we're here to discuss. So I just, I just wanted to say that. I don't, I'm not right. unsympathetic to what your client was trying right. to do. And, and I appreciate I, that. And we also, I don't mean No, that. go ahead. I believe Justice Kavanaugh was going to say Sorry, something. It's the acoustics in here. It's hard to tell where it's coming from. I, I, I understand, but aren't we, I mean, it's not, the, the statute doesn't make a distinction of whether or not, you know, while a, a public employer, you know, there are differing standards, right, for an employer or an employee making a report of a violation or a suspected violation. And in fact, our own case law says, right, that you still obtain whistleblower protection if you report internally. And even if your job as a public employee is to report report suspected violations of law, that is still covered under the statute, right? The statute, I mean, whether or not it's wise policy to have this go on in a prosecutor's office or any other sort of public employer, the statute doesn't make that distinction. And I think our case law, Brown and, and others have said that that is, that is still covered. Those public employees are still covered under whistleblowers. Is that That's under right. the statute? Right. That's right. And, the, and, I, and I, th I think that, and, and I appreciate that, because I think that brings us back really to the issue here before the court. And that is whether there was sufficient evidence to establish the elements of a Whistleblowers Protection Act claim in this case involving Ms. Janetsky and her report of a suspected violation of the MCL 771.1, which states that you can't give probation to a, a person who um, has been convicted of criminal sexual conduct and the fact that there was an order that was actually entered approving that sentence and and the plaintiff filed a motion to set that aside that was signed by Christopher Boyd wherein Christopher Boyd specifically admits that the sentence imposed cannot be imposed by law. It was violation to propose that uh, and so wait, wait, in this wait, wait, particular wait. case, you, we're you getting back. You said something that's interesting. Was it a law violation to propose it? What, what statute says it's illegal to propose that, that a resolution that may not comport with the statute? Because if that's true, there's a lot of people, a lot of charged with uh, enforcing the law that are violating the law, right? Is it a law violation to do that? No. It is a, it, it is a violation to permit a proposed sentence to go through that could result in the imposition what law, what law of a sentence that's not supported by the law, and what this law is what Ms. Janetsky was trying to prevent, what law and what she that? reported. What law prohibits that? Pardon me? Is there a statute that says you can't do that? Not, I'm not aware of that, uh, Justice, but I do know that the elements of a whistleblower's protection cl uh, claim in this case requires the plaintiff to, to establish good faith, that she had a good faith belief that a violation had occurred. She doesn't have to be right, okay? There's no evidence that she intentionally, falsely made this report. There's no evidence in the record, and that is the standard under the Whistleblowers Protection Act. That's what the issue is here. But the Ms. law Nikki, violation, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say before before we you run out of time, and on that point about can you, I, I even assuming that, that we were to agree with you that a whether she's right or not, a suspected, a good faith, you know, belief that there was a suspected violation may fall under the Whistleblowers Act. But is that good faith or suspect, you know, suspicion of that this statute would be violated, is that sufficient to sustain a claim under a, a public policy claim? In other words, that while the statute protects good faith belief of a suspected violation, does there need to be an actual violation? Does there need to be an actual that, you know, refusing to go along with this would be, I'm refusing to violate this law? Like, so the distinction may be, I know that there are many, but between the, the worker or the whistleblowers and the public policy claim, can you, like, is, is it indiscriminate? I mean, is it indistinct? No, well, I mean, is the it court has analysis? said, in, yeah, the court has said in Rivera, the Rivera case, that if the conduct that is alleged does not fall within um, the Whistleblowers Protection Act, um, then it can be an independent public policy claim. Does she have to be right, though, for the public policy? No, claim? I don't think, she doesn't have to be right. There's no, no requirement that she be right. 
Um, but as doesn't long there have as to be an actual violation belief. of law, even under the pub public policy claim? Pardon me? Does there actually have to be a violation of law under the public policy claim? Well, in a particular situation where a plaintiff is refusing to violate a law, um, I believe that there should be a good faith belief that this law is exists and that they're being asked to violate it and they refuse to violate violate it and as a result they're retaliated against. And so does there have to actually be a violation of the law? I think no. I think it would be it would go under the same kind of analysis as the Whistleblowers Protection Act in terms of good faith belief. Because what we're doing is we're trying to um, the public policy of the state. But the, sir, I, I think the, the, what we're trying to get at is there's a blurring between the good faith belief and the actual violation. Point out a good faith belief that there was about to be a violation of law, but don't doesn't there have to actually be the belief that the law was in fact violated? And here was the law in fact violated. Well, yes, the, the law was violated. There was an How order so? entered. There was an order entered that that had in it a sentence that could not be imposed But the, the sentence law. was not imposed. That's true. So how's there a violation? Because th there's, there's an order entered that gives, sanctions the judge to, to issue a sentence that cannot be imposed by law. Counsel, I actually want to just, I know your time's up, but I, I, I have one more question. Um, one of the things, I think these cases are really hard when you have public sector employers. I think it, it, it's hard to sort of separate the concepts. Um, I think that's what makes these cases complicated. Um, turning to your public policy claim, one of the things, if you look back at cases where that this court has decided on public policy grounds, um, they're usually private sector employers who have no avenue. Maybe they made an internal complaint about a safety violation or something, and so, um, the court has said that case can move forward on public policy grounds because, frankly, that person, they had no other, they had no Whistleblowers Protection Act complaint. It, it was a private sector employer. In this instance, public sector employer, how do we square that? Because it seems like any time your client would raise any concern with um, her boss um, that Basically, she can invoke the Whistleblowers Protection Act, unlike someone in the private sector where an internal complaint doesn't do that. Right. Well, I, I'm not aware of any distinction in terms of the Whistleblowers Protection Act or the Michigan public policy um, excluding from its protection, um, you know, public employees or assistant prosecutors. I'm not aware of that. And so I think that in this particular case, um, those claims would survive regardless, and they should be analyzed the same way. And I know you, we've spent a lot of time on this sentencing issue, um, but the other um, law that she reported had been violated was, was the Crimes Victims Act, and the failure of um, the chief assistant prosecutor to notify the victims that there had been a significant change in the strategy, and that a motion that was supposed to be a motion to remand was now a, a motion to enter a settlement, or a, a, a um, sentencing agreement, a plea agreement, and that was significant, and he never informed the victims of this change. And in that, and, and in that particular situation, um, Ms. Janetsky reported the violation that the crimes victim, victims had not been notified. And um, there really, if you read the, the Crimes Victims Act, it states specifically that before any significant new developments, in a case, the crime's victim should be made aware of that. And in this particular case- Where does case, it say new developments? Pardon me? Where does it say new developments? Well, it, I don't know that it says specifically new developments, but it says before finalizing any negotiations that may result in a plea or sentence bargain, a prosecutor shall offer the victims an opportunity to consult with the prosecuting attorney to obtain the victim's view. Did that happen in this case? No. No, I mean, wait, wait, at, at the wait, time, wait, 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 sorry. Before the negotiation was finalized, didn't they meet with the victim, victim's family? Didn't, didn't your client meet with the victim's family? My client met with the victim's family um, at the point that the strategy was to try the Was that defendant. before the negotiations were finalized? Uh, well. I'm just reading the statute. Yeah, right. And did well, she receive uh, their uh, input on what they thought? And so, did the prosecutor's office know what they thought? 
I mean, as a trial judge, I would want to know that the victim doesn't agree, and I probably would ask those questions at some point. And that's, I'm not condoning this practice, uh, you know, or, or saying that this was handled properly or not. But the statute, by its plain terms, was complied with. They met, they consulted with the victim, and they knew the victim's views, and they knew the victim's family would not like this disposition. And yet they went forward with it, which they have a right, the, the prosecutor has the authority to do, right? I, I would say that this discourse between the two of us is an example of a disagreement and doesn't show that the report of the violation of the law was made in bad faith or that she did it knowingly. I didn't say it was bad falsely. faith. The question well, is whether she reasonably understood that this the statutory requirement right. to be something other than what it plainly says on its face on a statute that her she's responsible for applying and following on a daily basis. Well, seems like she should probably know the statute better than most people, wouldn't you think? Well, I would say, Justice, that there's a disagreement about what the statute says because um, it clearly. In, you kind of read, you kind of changed what it said there. That's why I, I wanted to focus well, you on the actual language of the statute. It, it says it, before finalizing any negotiation. You just agreed with me that that condition was satisfied. No, the, the negotiations that were taking place were between Mr. Boyd and the defense attorney for Mr. Hannis, and they were not aware of those negotiations. They were not aware of a, a, a plea agreement that was entered. They were not aware that a motion to remand was being changed to a motion to enter a, um, a sentencing agreement. They were not aware of that. And so, again, going back to the requirements of the Whistleblowers Protection Act, and establishing whether the plaintiff reported in good faith a suspected violation of law, the elements are met in this particular case. Um, there's, there's no clarity in terms of that, and, and she in good faith believed that under the Crimes Victims Act that this was a requirement. And when you read the purpose of the Crimes Victim Act and you know, you know what its purpose is, this was a reasonable belief that it had been violated when he didn't notify the crimes victim that a whole change in strategy had occurred and that the defendant was now going to be potentially given probation for All a right. crime. We've gone way over. Is everybody satisfied? Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge. Yep. Morning to the court, Douglas Curlow appearing on behalf of the defendants at Belize. Um, I'm sure in its more reflective moments, the court thinks about the position of counsel when they appear before it trying to discern in advance what maybe the court is particularly interested in. And I really threw up my hands when I realized how many things there are potential in this case to discuss. Uh, counsel and the court has been discussing the uh, issue of the report, and this court's supplemental briefing order suggested that perhaps its primary interest was in whether there was a report made and what the criteria for that would be. Uh, but I'm wondering if maybe we might not be going down a bit of a rabbit hole in this court's June 2021 order in the Rivera versus SVRC case. Uh, it vacated the Court of Appeals discussion regarding what was and was not a report because of the failure in that case of the plaintiff to establish a causal connection. I'm wondering if maybe uh, straining over report uh, might be a, a false lead in this case, uh, given our contentions with regard to the lack of a causal connection uh, between the report, given that uh, the admission by the plaintiff is that uh, uh, Chief Assistant Prosecutor Boyd treated everybody the same way uh, it's hard to discern how you could say that there was a causal connection between her having given a report and being treated that way and the other assistant prosecutors being treated that way without having given a report. So I think the causal connection fails and maybe we don't need to strain over whether there's a report. And frankly, causal connection is doubtless necessary for a public policy claim as well. I'd also note just very quickly with regard to the public policy claim, all the cases I found on that topic dealt with situations of termination. In this case, Janetsky was never terminated. Uh, she just chose to resign uh, because she just did not want to work with Prosecutor Boyd. And the court may have its own opinion, doubtless, as do I, as to whether you'd like to work for Chief Assistant Prosecutor Boyd. Uh, Counsel, I just, to your point um, about that, um, 
Mr. Boyd treated others in the same fashion. Um, plaintiff has alleged she was treated even worse than those people. Does that make a difference? Well, as I read her own letter from June 4, 2015, she says it's the same atmosphere of everybody, not only the prosecutors, but also the staff. Uh, if you look at, uh, basically she's, got, I think it conceptually breaks into two parts. Was there retaliation in the initial stages when there was the, uh, the plea agreement issue? And then Counsel, was there retaliation a, a after no, I, that? Because I have a question. I mean, just sure. to follow up on, on uh, Justice Welch, I mean, is it, I'm trying to understand the argument. Is the defense that it's just it was just horrible for everybody? Is that kind of the essence of your defense? Well, based on uh, Mr. That, like this was just an awful place and everybody was treated horribly, so this was just a horrible place for everybody? If we accept the facts as pleaded and argued by uh, Plaintiff Janetsky, as we must on a motion for summary disposition, yeah, it doesn't seem like a very nice place by her description of it, if you accept her description. But to return to Judge uh, Justice Welch's, uh, to, initially the supposed retaliation was being ordered to violate the law in the sense of this plea agreement. But it was very clear that uh, Prosecutor McColgan empowered Ms. Janetsky to make the resolution to set the si system right as she saw fit. Now, there was the debate in the office uh, with Chief Assistant Prosecutor Boyd as to whether this was what should have done, and in fact, the case seems to have unraveled. He would have at least had a conviction uh, on his deal. Uh, right, so I, 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 right. Concede, I think everyone concedes, yes, she was permitted to sort of yes. fix so this it, issue, but, but obviously her allegation is it got worse after that and there was continued right. retaliation, obviously. Right, but the, but the question then is, what's the evidence that it was worse for her than anyone else? And based on her description in her letter, it was the same for everyone else. Now, she cites a number of different instances where uh, she had confrontations with Boyd, especially the issue on uh, uh, June 1, 2015. Uh, but there's no evidence in this case from any of the other assistant prosecutors that they were treated any differently. She says they were treated the same. Uh, it would have been her burden of proof to show that she was in fact being treated differently than the others to demonstrate that it was uh, her claim could succeed. If everyone else was treated the same way, and that's her words in her own letter, taking the time to write it down, then I don't think she's got an evidentiary leg to stand on to make that point. That, um, that, that might assist your defense with respect to the whistleblower claim or the public policy claim. But what about the intentional tort? How does that help? Well, the intentional tort claim comes down to the, uh, <laughs> the basically the immunity of, of uh, Chief Assistant Prosecutor Boyd. Again, whether one subjectively appreciates uh, Chief Assistant Prosecutor Boyd's management style, the question is, subjectively, did he in good faith believe that what he was doing was an appropriate management method? Uh, personally, I have worked in an office with somebody who was a screamer. Uh, it could make you uncomfortable, but I learned over time that was just their way of communicating a point. Well, we're not talking, I mean, the allegation isn't just that he had offensive management skills, right, or style. I mean, the allegation, I mean, how do you in commit an intentional tort, such as assault, or barring her from leaving the office, physically barring her from leaving the office, as alleged, how do you commit an intentional tort in good faith? Well, the question is, is a, is a manager committing a tort when he tries to insist that a person who he directly supervises and believes has acted inappropriately prevents them from avoiding the conversation by forcing them to stay and confront the issue? Is that a tort? Well, <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends upon how he does that, right? I mean, no. He, Saying you need to sit here and you need to do this and listen to me or there could be consequences, and screaming in her face and physically blocking the door and preventing her from leaving, both may be a management style, but one is an intentional tort and one is not, right? I, I don't perceive those to be a tort in that situation. I think that's a, that's a, 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 a may be very appropriate to prevent someone from getting away from a necessary discussion. <laughs> physically, physically blocking her from leaving a he, room. He didn't physically block her, he held the door. There's a difference. By her description, he held the door, 
He never struck her. He never touched her. She never. Well, he, he never attempted her to do from so. From leaving the office, he fit, you just can see he physically prevented her from leaving the office. You know the. the That's the testimony. Of the, and the, you're aware of the elements of the tort of false imprisonment. That's correct. But uh, I, there, there is citation in my brief to a case uh, discussion where you can detain uh, an employee for purposes of supervisory admonition and investigation. Um, let me see. Surely I'll put that. Oh, uh, Moore versus City of Detroit, Court of Appeals, 2002. Uh, I mean, you can't just have employees say, well, I don't want to confront this issue. I'm just going to walk away every time well, but you get, you it's, it gets intense in an error. office I mean, debate. I mean, yeah, you can, you she options. can suffer consequences. You just can't in, commit a tort against her, right? But I guess the question, more importantly, is at least from the dismissal point, and the Court of Appeals is saying the question is, you know, assuming that she's alleged an intentional tort, is he entitled to immunity from that because he, in good faith, believed that it was he appropriate? could commit an intentional tort? Yes, he. Th well, all torts are commits of commitment of torts. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a need for immunity. Now, would there? You only need immunity if there, in fact, has been a tort. So, if we assume, as the justice wishes to that there has been a tort in the context of trying to stop an employee from avoiding an employment discussion with a supervisor, then he still has immunity because I don't know anything that would tell him it was not in good faith or that it was an act of malice to prevent someone from leaving that conversation. I mean, if I have a dispute with my assistant, frankly, I don't, I hope she doesn't listen to this, uh, I. Uh, I mean, I'm going to expect her to stay and hear what I have to say, and not dismiss no herself to the restroom. To what you can do? What's that? To, is there no limit to what you can do in order to make her stay? I would think I could close my office door and say, I need you to stay here and address this issue with me. Can you put your hand on the office door and keep the door closed? Sure. For how long? Well, in this case, it was 30 seconds. I don't think it's out of, out of uh, step. In fact, it was he who opened the door and then asked Nate Collison, the union rep, to come in and say, look, I, I who knows what thoughts went through his head, but obviously he needed to have some greater discussion and some else, you know, someone else involved in the situation, and that's what he did after 30 So seconds. I actually, I, I agree there are contexts that that can absolutely be appropriate, and it happens all the time where managers close the door to have a private discussion mm -hmm. for difficult employment issues. Um, and honestly, though, there's like obviously degrees here we're struggling mm -hmm. with. Isn't this a fact issue? Well, no, because remember, the issue is whether uh, Assistant Prosecutor Boyd subjectively, as the defendant, thought that what he was doing was honest and in good faith and without malice. If we treat it as a fact issue, then we wind up putting ourselves where the jury can, subject, can use their own subjective perceptions of what good office management is to negate. I mean, the position has to be what could uh, uh, Boyd have perceived? Did, what did he perceive? And in this case, there's no basis to say that you could not, in his position as the supervisor, especially, I suppose, given his background of his management style, say, this is an appropriate act, honestly, in good faith, this is what I need to do to get this person to do the job correctly. So it's subjective based on an individual's management style? Well, it's subjective based on Boyd's impression of what is what his honest belief. What if Boyd subjectively believed that he could physically assault her? And if that's his, his honest belief, and he thought he could do it to everybody. He's an equal opportunity, right? I mean, if, if it, does it go that far? I or is there so. any like sort of realm of, is there any limit to that? I, I don't think for a minute that Judge uh, Boyd ever thought that he could assault her. What he thought was he could hold his door to prevent her from leaving the conversation. I'm sure that's the only but thing that's going through his mind. But if he was wrong and that, uh, and that constituted an intentional tort. Not in that context. I'm Otherwise, you're saying any, any employee, especially government employer, employees, who need to be managed for the benefit of the public as a whole can just walk away from their supervisors. 
Well, that would be a disciplinary issue, of course. Well, I recognize that person could be written up. They could be certainly um, for certainly. not listening to feedback. I understand that. Well, I mean, you could just fire them, but you don't want to fire them. You want to keep them in the, in the fold as employees working in your office with their experience and make that point that you need to make as a supervisor that certain things need to be done certain ways in your view, and they're going to be done that way. You can't just walk away from me and pretend that the issue doesn't exist. I think we, I think we get it. I, I wanted to though clarify. I think Justice Kavanaugh was asking if he could batter her because she does allege an assault. An assault, of course, the intentional tort of assault doesn't require any battery. So I, I think there is an right, intentional but, assault. Uh, there is an, a, an assault alleged in this case. Right, but her testimony was there's certainly no battery involved. Correct. I just wanted to clarify the yes. hypothetical. So yeah, I, I, I understand, but I think in context, no tort arises. Understood. Um, To address uh, the issue of the report itself, at least with my remaining time, since that was the primary uh, discussion previously, um, I think Justice Welch had an interesting point with the fact that uh, you could almost have a, with a public employee, you could almost say that any office disagreements could suddenly become some issue of, uh, you know, a, a law violation having happened. But, uh, I think that's a, a reason there needs to be care taken with the good faith and reasonable belief elements of the uh, report that's being made. Also, I would point out that Judge, uh, that I keep saying Judge because a lot of people refer to him as Judge Boyd in the, because he had been a judge. I, Chief Assistant Prosecutor Boyd, uh, that he admitted that it was an illegal plea deal. He never did any such thing. What he did was he signed what Janetsky wrote. McColgan had said, you solve the problem your way. Boyd expressed his disagreement, but ultimately he signed what she produced. Just let's solve the problem. That's, that's hardly retaliation. That's going along with it. Uh, but it wasn't an admission on his part. And again, he said, if I made a mistake, I wanted to be the one to set it right. I wanted to sign the papers. I wanted to set it right. He conceded, you know, I'm not, I'm not setting myself up as God here. I could have made a mistake. And he went along and solved the problem. If he, if he admitted that he could, or in that, and you're saying signing that as an officer of the court and submitting it to the court and saying, if I was wrong, I want to be the one to admit it. It was a mistake. It could have been a good faith. Why is that then not, why does that same, why doesn't that transfer to the plaintiff that she had a good faith belief that this was in fact illegal? Because I don't think she could. Remember, he is going along to placate her and he, do what McColgan told him was to let her solve it. Uh, and there's a difference between saying, I will do what you tell me to do to solve it, because McColgan has told me to, and saying, I really did something wrong, or that you should have believed this statute was contrary to what I think it really says. Okay. Uh, did I hear a ding? Yes. I'm used, sorry. We used up all your time. <laughs> Thank you. And we, we used up more than your time, Ms. McGee. I, I apologize. The case will be submitted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both.